starting in 5 seconds unfortunately the agreement arrived at was not put into practice i was in favor of joint consultations between the engineers of both sides a thousand obstacles were created from pakistan's side they would not talk or allow us to go on perhaps they thought that by raising obstacles they would be able to arrest our progress they could not do that now suddenly we are told that the 1948 agreement was useless and that it was secured under duress as i told you it so happened that i was also presented at those talks and can give personal testimony the present governor general of pakistan was also presented there as one of the signatories i cannot understand how i or anybody else could coerce him into appending his signature it is very undignified for countries to argue like small lawyers big countries do big things with big minds whether it is peace or war it is not in my nature to indulge in legal quibbling i gave up law 40 years back spokesman of pakistan said that they had denounced the 1948 agreement an agreement between two parties cannot be cancelled by unilateral action and so the dispute went on some people of the world bank came here from america and talked with us and with pakistan they were prepared to mediate so that our engineers and pakistani engineers might hold discussions with their help this was what we had been saying from the very beginning that our engineers and their should hold joint consultations because there were sufficient water for all so we accepted the world bank's proposal and said that we were ready if they could mark make them agree to joint consultations between the engineers they told us that as long as the talks went on we should not reduce the supply of water to pakistan from this side please remember that the 1948 agreement with pakistan which i just mentioned laid down that india had a right to reduce the supply of waters but this was to be done gradually so that pakistan might get time sufficient time was given and years passed we had thus a right to reduce the supply of water still we agreed to the world bank's suggestion not to reduce the supply as long as the talks went on it was not envisaged at that time that this arrangement was meant for old times we thought that the talks would go on for 5 or 6 months and would come to some conclusion we hoped that the result would be helpful so taking everything into consideration we accepted the suggestion for the duration of about 6 months those 6 months lengthened into a year and now to 2 and 6 months a half years it is a strange situation to talk which are held with pakistan go on lengthening so much that there does not seem to be any end to them i get sick of this i want a decision this way or that way the world bank people put forward a proposition of their own about 3 or 4 months ago it is clear that they had no authority to force us as mediators they had merely a right 
to put forward a suggestion it was for us to accept or reject it they put forward a suggestion when they thought that our direct talks were not going to yield any result their scheme more or less provided for a division of the rivers of the punjab pakistan was to take the waters of some rivers and we were to take the waters of some other rivers that is there was no doubt that we were to get all the waters of our side but they laid a very great burden on us we were asked to give financial aid to pakistan so that she might construct new canals from other rivers to get more water they did not clearly specify the amount but they indicated a very large sum it was a heavy burden on us but we considered and consulted the punjab government and thought that if the matter was being settled once for all and our welfare as well as the welfare of pakistan lay in it then we should accept the payment of the heavy price demanded from us so we wrote to the world bank within a few days that we accepted the basic principle put forward by them and though it imposed a very heavy burden on us we were prepared to pay this price so that the matter might be settled peacefully and we could go on with our work in our country in peace we said pakistan would also benefit thereby we thus accepted the proposal within a few days but pakistan did not give any reply though weeks and month passed we were very perturbed our representatives are still sitting in washington new york and other cities of america for this purpose stop starting in 5 seconds a long time has passed and a reply from pakistan is still awaited it is a strange situation we wanted to recall our representatives they had no work to do but then we thought that pakistan might make it a pretext and say that we recalled them therefore we let them stay there till such time as a reply was received in the end we told that the world bank to fix some date for pakistan's reply so that we might know where we stood otherwise a whole lifetime might pass in waiting they accepted our suggestion and told pakistan that they should reply within a week whether they accepted the principle or not with details to be settled later when they did this pakistan showed signs of life and began to run about in the end their honorable minister undertook the long journey to washington many things were said about the issue neither yes nor no but that they would consider and so on the world bank told them that this reply amounted to a rejection should it be taken that they had rejected the proposals or had this something more to say pakistan saw how the matter would end they felt that if they rejected the proposals and india accepted them the consequences would perhaps not be good for them because the effect would have been that our interim agreement would come to an end the discussions would end and the world's bank suggestions to us to pay them crores of rupees would become ineffective the rights of both sides were clear then the world bank asked pakistan to give a clear reply we had made our arrangements for the return of the our deputation 
but only three or four days ago pakistan said that they accepted the principle underlying the proposals put forward by the world bank but they added that they could not give a final reply unless the whole picture was before them that is the same old legal quibbling on one side they say that they have accepted the proposals and on the other they keep the door open for escape on the pretext that they have not seen the full picture this is where matters stand at present meanwhile when pakistan did not accept the proposals we wrote to the world bank that we had been marking time for 3 months or so therefore our agreement not to reduce the water supply no longer held good we resumed our freedom of action we were ready to talk when they or pakistan wanted because we did not intend to shut the door to agreement but the talks had ended and our delegation would be returning home the bank people told us however that pakistan's attitude was changing and that they were saying that they accepted the principle since there were chances that a way out would be found the bank asked our delegation to wait for a few days more our representatives agreed to do so the point is that our former agreement with the world bank or with pakistan for not reducing the supply of water has ended pakistan we have every right to reduce it but we do not want to stand on legal rights in this matter we want to do something which would harm neither pakistan nor us therefore we again told them that we would not do anything in haste which may harm the land owners and peasants in pakistan we would give them a chance to make their own arrangements after all we had to reduce the supply of water but we would do it having regards to the conditions that is we still stood by the principles which we accepted in the agreement of 1948 if you have read the pakistan newspapers you will see that there is a great storm and outcry as if something is going to take place on july 8 here in nangal which would immediately stop the waters flowing into pakistan and create a drought as a result of which lakhs and crores of people would die of hunger and thirst this is wrong and deplorable we cannot tolerate it we have told pakistan clearly time and again that for the present we would not reduce the supply of water it is a fact that they have built one or two canals from which they can take some water therefore they can take water from their side and we would reduce supplies to that extent this would not reduce their total supply of water if they could build some more canals as they intend then this process would go on the exploratory talks held under the auspices of the world bank made it clear that there is no dearth of water only an arrangement to bring the waters to the desired directions was lacking it is evident that on our side in east punjab we have no other source of water than the satluj you can see that from the map stop starting in 5 seconds sir the more important function that the upper house performs is that it suppresses the separatist forces and affords an opportunity 
to the state to have their say in national legislation and in fact in the debates in the constituent assembly this aspect was put with great emphasis by the honorable members the second chamber is essential in a federal structure because the house of people being the representative of the people obviously the people will have their say there but the states also should have a say of their own in a democratic constitution and the rajya sabha being a council of states obviously the states will have a say and in our constitution we have recognized the importance of the voice of the states because certain constitutional amendments cannot go through unless they are passed by the majority of the states therefore in our democracy people are the main criteria but the opinion of the majority of the states on important issues is also an important factor whether this aspect will be properly fulfilled by the rajya sabha will be dependent to a great extent on the composition and the powers which the rajya sabha has in comparison with some of the other second chamber that we have in the world today for example the most powerful second chamber in the world today everyone will have to agree is the senate of the united states the senate members are directly elected their powers are also much wider because the senate possesses the power of even voiting treaties which are agreed upon by the president ratification by the senate is necessary before a treaty comes into force and up till now more than 60 treaties have been voted by the senate in the united states senate each state is represented by two members irrespective of its size and population now let us look to another federal in australia the senate is not as powerful as that of the usa there are 50 senators and they are elected 10 each from the five states therefore irrespective of the size of the population uniformity is maintained there also of all the senates same in the case in switzerland also where each state has two members in russia where in spite of the divergence and composition of the population and the area 25 deputies are there from each republic the only country where this principle is not followed is canada and we are following to a certain extent that pattern in canada 120 members are nominated by the governor general and four provinces have 24 members each and other provinces have got varying number of members with a minimum of 4 we have to a certain extent followed the pattern of canada and because we have accepted the principle of both nomination and indirect election and also the principle of not having uniform representation our principle has been to provide one representative for every additional 5 millions of the population and one for every additional 2 million or part thereof why i am objecting and asking for a amendment and asking this house to consider the necessity of changing the present structure i will just new come to that in the house of the people obviously the house being representatives of the people the populous states will have more representatives nobody can deny it and that should be the first and basic principle but unless 
there is another chamber where the smaller states may feel that they are not overwhelmed by the populous states i think to a certain extent a situation may arise some day when the smaller states may feel that their problems are not being discussed in the proper perspective as it should be discussed obviously at this moment i will concede that not only the quantity but quality also counts but in a democracy the number also counts very much nobody can deny and in fact this is one of the reasons probably which prompted all other federal domestic democratic countries like the united states russia and switzerland to have uniformity of the number representing their states in the united states we find that the senate and house of representatives try to strike a balance of conflicting interests through different compositions conflicting with one another for example in the united states we find that they have got eight farming states and these states have 47 representatives in the house of representatives whereas there are industrial states and the number of their representatives in the house of representative is 174 in the house of representatives the disparity is there the industrial states may have a dominating voice and much more time may be taken in discussing the industrial matters but that has been balanced in the upper house i feel we should have also a fresh view as to whether the composition of the rajya sabha should be changed because of this first principle alone this should be considered very carefully stopped starting in 5 seconds it was a happy idea to start an institution named after gandhi ji for the purpose of cultural advancement mahatma gandhi lived for nearly 80 years during this long period there was hardly any aspect of life which he did not touch those of us who had the opportunity of living when he lived and worked have been really very fortunate generations yet unborn will recall with wonder and admiration how millions of us could see him walking this land talking to people and actually working with his hands in the course of his eventful life he gained unparalleled fame as a political leader but it will be only a partial view of his life if we think that he was merely a political leader his political career assumed importance because he fought for the freedom of the country with his unique weapons of truth and non violence not that others before him did not think of freedom of the country or work for it in fact many devoted their whole life to this mission the unique contribution of gandhi ji's lay in the fact that he placed in our hands weapons that brought us our freedom non violence and satyagraha on which he insisted were not intended only for political purposes he looked upon them as the fundamental principles of his life and applied them to every question that came up to him for consideration he did not claim at any time to have evolved a philosophy or a system of philosophy he was never tired of saying that instead of writing a thesis he was engaged in the actual application of his principles to concrete problems that came up before him and if we 
turn over the pages of his writings we can see time devoting column after column to very small and minor items to him a small item was not unimportant if it involved a question of principle he was so cautious about the application of his principles that he evolved a whole series of propositions which applied to the life of man a small incident like the shooting of a monkey or the killing of a calf would attract his attention as much as the big question of the winning of swaraj if he was so very careful about his principles and so very method methodical about their application that he should take a comprehensive view of things it is quite true that every problem cannot be solved through ahimsa everything has its own action and reaction in the world of today we find that countries have been fighting countries and nations have been fighting one another for many a long years within our generation we have seen two worlds war fought for the purpose of ending war can anyone in his senses claim that war has ended or that all this violence which has been there for ages succeeded in ending violence whether in the sphere of religion economics or politics violence has never solved any question if it had solved problems there would have been no problem left for us to solve but the fact that there still are problems today shows that they have not been solved by the methods so far pursued by governments can aimsa solve our problems the answer is none too simple the application of ahimsa to our present day problems is no doubt difficult but perhaps it is not more difficult than ahimsa take the example of an army which fights if there is a war in one generation the army is prepared throughout the period for fighting every soldier has to prepare himself from day to day and hour to hour for the fight and apart from the actual soldier the whole nation has to prepare itself to support the soldiers and this process has gone on for ages and from generation to generation nobody can say that ahimsa has been tried out to the same extent in any country or by any people the great service that mahatma gandhi rendered to mankind was that he gave it a trial in this country he had to deal with such material as was then available to him i cannot claim that we were very good material yet even with this indifferent material he was able to achieve his objective it should not require much effort to imagine that if it is tried on a bigger scale we can achieve other nobler objectives also it is a fact that the world today is beginning to turn towards gandhi ji with the atom bomb and the hydrogen bomb they have practically come to the end of tether as far as the other method is concerned thoughtful and far seeing people have recognized that they are on the look out for an alternative and naturally their thought turns to mahatma gandhi's method but unfortunately there is so far no complete understanding of that method it will not be right to think that other people are unable to understand gandhi ji this is not correct stop starting in 5 seconds
sir i beg to move that the bill to provide for the payment of equal remuneration to men and women workers and for the prevention of discrimination on the ground of sex against women in the matter of employment and for matters connected therewith or incidental thereto be taken into consideration a significant measure taken by government in recent months has been the promulgation of the equal remuneration ordinance providing for the payment of equal remuneration to men and women workers and for the prevention of discrimination against women on the ground of sex in the matter of employment and for the other connected matters this measure is significant not only because it coincide with the international women's year and brings us fully in line with accepted international standards but also because it brings immediate relief to millions of our women fold employed or seeking employment as most of these women belong to the weaker sections of the community and are largely employed in agriculture and unorganized sector of industry is it only appropriate that this measure was taken on a priority basis as a part of the government's policy of improving the condition of the weaker and exploited sections of the community although we in india have always held our women in high regard and given them a position of importance in society their contribution to the economic life of the community has been fully appreciated but a radical change in attitudes has been brought about by the nation's struggle for independence india women by their active participation in the country's struggle for independence have earned their rightful place in the community and won their legal rights without the need for any aggressive movement their claim for a position of complete equality in law was justified in terms of their significant contribution to the cause of the country freedom it was fully recognized by the founding fathers of the indian republic the indian constitution provide the right of equal opportunity for employed men and women without distinction article 15 of the constitution prohibits any discrimination on grounds of sex and article 39 or our constitution of india and why says is that the state shall direct its polity amongst other things towards securing that there is equal pay for equal work for both men and women india also ratified the international labor organization convention concerning equal remuneration for women the act does not specifically provide that wages to be paid to men and women workers should be equal consequently different rates of wages were laid down in several cases at the time of initial fixation of minimum wages besides there is no restriction on the fixation of different rates of wages for men and women in the sectors not covered as a result of bipartite or tripartite negotiations or arbitration awards could be different for men and women for similar jobs while over the years there has been some narrowing down of the difference in wages of men and women workers wages disparities on grounds of sex still exist in the country even after years of the ratification of the international labor organization convention the national commission on labor 
while noting that the fixation of statutory minimum wages has tended to narrow the gap between men and women observed that wages discrimination between men and women still prevails in certain sector like agriculture and unorganized industry the committee on status of women in india also strongly recommended legislative action in this regard to provide for equal pay for equal work honorable members of this august house have on several occasions expressed their feelings on this matter and have urged immediate and effective remedial action the matter was discussed at the 25th session of the labor ministers conference held in september last year it was unanimously agreed that the states which had not so far implemented fully the international labor organization convention both in letter and spirit should do so by taking appropriate measure to fix wages accordingly to occupations within a period of 3 months by not later than 6 months it was also suggested suggested that statutory provision be made to prevent by partite agreements fixing different wages rates for men and women workers to give effect to the constitutional provision as well as ensure striker conformity to the international labor organization conversion the equal remuneration ordinance was promulgated by the president it was much needed and overdue measure designed to benefit a large number of women labor and it was felt that any delay in promulgating the ordinance would affect adversely the interests of the women workers it was also felt that it will be in the fitness of things to bring forward this measure to implement the provision of the constitution in the year 2012 which was being celebrated as the international labor year it is proposed to replace the ordinance by an act of parliament so the bill was introduced in the rajya sabha stop starting in 5 seconds i am very happy to have this opportunity to meet you great responsibility vests on the shoulders of our civil services particularly the indian administrative service ours is a large country characterized by great diversity great complexity and the unity and integrity of india has to be the primary concern of all those involved in the processes of governance this does not mean that we should lose sight of a peculiar circumstances in which your respective states may be placed i think ours is a unique administrative setup it is a federal setup and services like the indian administrative services perform that twin combination of concern with local circumstances and at the same time wider concern that these local problems are resolved in a manner which strengthens the bonds of unity and strengthens the nation's integrity of all the services in our country the indian administrative service has performed its role with greatest efficiency integrity and commitment to national values i said that ours is a country of great diversity and great complexity we have in our country religions all the great religions represented in our society we have also large number of groups of people who are under privileged and who have been discriminated against for centuries and when the constitution of india was being drawn up the founding fathers of our republic took it upon themselves to make up for those centuries of inequity by giving them a privileged position 
when it comes to admission to civil services are concerned when it comes to giving them a share in processes of governance through participation in the state legislatures and parliament it is therefore very essential that our civil servants should be aware of the extreme complexity of managing an entire country of india's diversity i would therefore urge all of you that though you must specialize in acquiring a deep understanding of the problem faced by your respective states you must also dwell deep into the whole process of nation building in a country of india's size india's diversity and india's complexity i would also say that we are learning in a world where human knowledge is growing at a unprecedented pace therefore your stint at the academy cannot and should not involve an end of the thrust of acquisition of knowledge i think our training modules suggest that life has to be one of continuous process our country has been growing at a handsome rate in the last 15 years ever since the reform program was launched our growth rate has averaged above 6 to 6.5 percent in recent years we have improved upon that performance our growth rate is now around 7.5 to 8 percent and we can increase this growth rate and we need that growth because it is only in a rapidly expanding economy that can find meaningful solutions to the problems of acute poverty deprivation which still characterizes many parts of our country and if growth is not there the whole process of redistribution of incoming wealth becomes a zero sum game and when social processes become zero sum games they give rise to great degree of anger frustration and therefore we need this vibrant growth to provide the wherewithal in which the redistributing processes can become a positive sum game and not a zero sum game and therefore understanding of the process of growth particularly paying attention to the needs of rural development paying particular attention to the delivery of basic social services such as health education or the management to the municipal and panchayati raj institutions all these are integral to our understanding of the processes of growth processes of change and i sincerely hope that you will take permanent interest in all these processes of nation building when i look at the civil servant in the british time there is one thing which strikes me many of them although they came to our country from far away distant land many of them spent lot of time in understanding the sociology and economics of how india's rural dynamic works i think of late probably because people don't stay in jobs long enough therefore i think that that depth of knowledge that our civil servants need to understand processes of change particularly in the rural sector the problems of disadvantaged community scheduled castes scheduled tribes they do not receive the attention that they deserve that's why you have tension in the rural india the nexalite problem these are problems which have several dimensions a law and order dimension is important and no state can really neglect the enforcement of law and order and also enforcement of the rule of law in our country but you must also recognize that there are i think underlying tensions arising out of the fact that not all sections of our society get an equitable share or the benefit of growth benefits of development and therefore i think you have to pay particular attention to being the custodians of the well being 
of the weaker sections stop starting in 5 seconds let me at the outset extend my heartiest congratulations to the recipients of the president's police medals for distinguished service i commend you for your dedication and devotion to the cause of national security and effective policing i would also like to offer my heartfelt condolences to the families of your brave colleagues who sacrificed their lives in the service of the nation i give you my assurance that our government will spare no effort to ensure that their needs are met and their futures secured as i addressed you all here today my mind goes back to some of the key issues i had raised in the same conference last year i had spoken of the challenges facing the police forces today of equipping the police forces with the necessary material and intellectual resources to meet these challenges of the need to generate professionalism honesty integrity and efficiency in the police of the need to improve the public image of the police whereby a policeman can be seen as a friend of the people of addressing the material needs of policemen particularly of those at the cutting edge grassroots level and of reforming the police system so as to make it a more effective and human organization periodic conferences like this are a good occasion to reflect on the progress made in achieving these goals i had also asked the home ministry to quickly examine the recommendations of earlier committees on police reforms and suggest easily implementable measures i am happy to note that some progress has been made police forces across the world continue to face an increasingly complex environment new security threats have come to the force bringing in their wake new challenges governments across the world are trying to grapple with them to formulate suitable responses in a large diverse country of continental dimensions undergoing social economic and political change your job is even more challenging at a recent meeting with the superintendents of police i was impressed by the seriousness with which young officers were applying their minds to the problem at hand i had spoken to them of the changes that have taken place since the police act was passed in 1861 today police forces have to serve the interests of the people not rural in a democratic framework as we are in today there is a need to have in the police force a managerial philosophy a value system and an ethos in tune with the items i had emphasized the need to ensure that police forces at all levels change from a federal force to a democratic service the spirit of public service of respect for the rights of individuals of being just and human in one's actions must permit the entire police force i was impressed by the response of the young officers to the challenge i had outlined and i am convinced that in them you have a group of officers who can transform policing in the country they look up to you for professional leadership you have to set an example to them so that they set an example to society what are the key challenges facing the police force today clearly the threat of terrorism and of organized crime are the two most important 
बट देयर आर अदर चैलेंजेस ऑफ इक्वल इम्पोर्टेंस टू आवर पीपल द अटैक्स ऑन वीकर सेक्शंस ऑन दलित्स ऑन माइनॉरिटीज एंड ऑन वुमेन आवर पुलिस फोर्स मस्ट बी इक्वल टू द टास्क इन डीलिंग विद ईच ऑफ दैम वी नीड अ कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ फोर्स एंड इंटेलिजेंस इन डीलिंग विद ईच ऑफ दीज चैलेंजेस इन डीलिंग विद सोशल एंड जेंडर बाइज्ड वायलेंस देर मस्ट बी कॉम्पैशन फॉर द विक्टम एंड फर्म रिजोल्व टू डील विद द परपेट्रेटर ऑफ द क्राइम आई कॉल अपॉन यू टू डिवोट पर्टिकुलर अटेंशन टू क्राइम्स अगेंस्ट ऑल वलनरेबल सेक्शंस ऑफ सोसाइटी सच एज मेंबर्स ऑफ द शेड्यूल्ड कास्ट एंड शेड्यूल्ड ट्राइब्स वुमेन चिल्ड्रन एंड सीनियर सिटीजन्स विद इकोनॉमिक प्रोग्रेस सम ऑफ द फोल्ट लाइन्स इन सोसाइटी हैव ऑल्सो बिकम वाइड दिस हैज ब्रॉड एडिशनल रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी ऑन द पुलिस फोर्सेज टू एंश्योर दैट लो एंड ऑर्डर इज मेंटेन्ड एंड नो सेगमेंट नो मैटर हाउ मीक इज ओप्रेस्ड इट इज ट्रू दैट ऑन अकाउंट ऑफ अ वेराइटी ऑफ फैक्टर्स द फ्रूट्स ऑफ डेवलपमेंट्स हैव नॉट रीच सर्टेन सेक्शंस ऑफ द सोसाइटी द गवर्नमेंट इज कमिटेड टू प्रोवाइडिंग इक्वल अपॉर्चुनिटीज टू एवरी कम्युनिटी एंड एवरी सेक्शन ऑफ द पॉपुलेशन द पुलिस मस्ट ऑल्सो बी व्यूड एज अ फेयर एफिशियंट एंड ऑनेस्ट सर्विस द पीपल मस्ट हैव कॉन्फिडेंस इन योर professionalism while instilling fear in those breaching the law and threatening the security of the country the police at the same time must be perceived as friends by the law abiding common citizens i have repeatedly said that no grievance real or imaginary have can justify resort to terror violence or any other anti social activity democracies provide legitimate means to express dissent stop starting in 5 seconds the prosecution and the complainant will also of course be given an opportunity to examine their own witnesses and to cross examine the witnesses who have been got examined on behalf of the accused and for that purpose notices of the proceedings before the jj board shall be served on the complainant as it is possible that in some cases the prisoners mentioned in the state's list may indeed be below 18 years in age on the date of offence but as the basis for arrival at the conclusion in the state's list were usually some preliminary medical examinations and no detailed steps for ascertaining ages had been taken after hearing both parties and it cannot be ruled out that in certain cases extraneous measures may have been used for reducing the ages we think that such an exercise as detailed above wherein the ages are ascertained after hearing both parties was needed the said exercise is to be completed within a period of 2 months and the reports submitted to this court on its next listing the district judges or district legal services authorities shall take strict measures in future for ensuring that prisoners below 18 years of age on the date of offence are not lodged in adults prison in violation of the juvenile justice act and rules so far as district alabad is concerned we direct the district judge alabad to permit rohan gupta advocate to visit and interview the concerned prisoners for the purpose of ascertaining their ages and for submitting the report to the court on the next date of listing
it was further submitted by the learned council for the petitioner that so far as the prisoner raju is concerned whose age was determined to be below 18 years he was earlier lodged in faizabad jail and was subsequently sent to the special home as he was convicted as far back as in the year 2001 in a case under section 302 ipc the respondents should inform this court about the total period spent in jail by this prisoner and in case it exceeds 3 years the basis for his being presently detained in the special home thus wide the order referred to above passed in a public interest litigation being criminal the alabad high court directed the juvenile justice boards to hold an inquiry for determination of the age of prisoners the medical board subjected the writ applicant herein to the x-rays of the skulls etc upon medical examination of the writ applicant herein the medical board gave its report certifying that the date of the commission of the alleged offense the writ applicant could have been around 15 years of age as on the date of the medical examination the convict was around 56 years of age it appears that some time later the writ petition applicant was in a position to obtain a document in the form of family register issued under the up panchayat raj rules 1970 in the family register certificate the year of birth of the writ applicant herein is shown as 1968 if 1968 is the correct birth year of the writ applicant herein then in 1982 he was about 14 years of age in such circumstances referred to above the writ applicant is here before this court he claims that as he was a juvenile on the date of the commission of the alleged offense sometime in the year 1982 he could not have been put to trial along with other co accused and should have been dealt with under the provisions of the juvenile justice act as prevailing at the relevant point of time it is the prayer of the writ applicant that the respondent state be directed to get the claim of the writ applicant in regard to the juvenility verified through the concerned sessions court or the juvenile justice board mr rishi malotra the learned counsel appearing for the writ applicant vehemently submitted that although till the dismissal of the special leave petition by this court with order the convict had not raised the plea of juvenility yet the law permits him to raise such a plea even at this point of time having regard to the provisions of the juvenile justice care and protection of children amendment act 2011 it is submitted that there is clinching evidence on record as on date in the form of certificate issued by the medical board as well as the family register to indicate that in the year 1982 the writ applicant could be around 15 years of age the learned counsel would vehemently submit that there is no good ground to discard the certificate issued by the medical board as well as the extract of the family register to forfeitify the aforesaid submissions the learned counsel seeks to rely upon a three judge bench decision of this court in the case of 
Gulam Hossain vs State of West Bengal reported in 2012 10 SCC 489 stop starting in 5 seconds respondent fool singh after his acquittal move an application before the authorities for his reinstatement since the authorities did not respond favorably he filed a writ petition in the year 1998 before a learned single judge of Rajasthan High Court the challenge of his dismissal from service though was made only after his acquittal in the criminal case yet the challenge was on various other grounds as well such as the order of termination not being passed by the appointing authority non supply of inquiry report not being allowed to cross examine the witness etc all these grounds did not find favor with the learned single judge except for the ground raised by the respondent that now since he has faced a criminal trial on the same set of charges where he was ultimately acquitted by the session court his dismissal order is liable to be quashed and he should be reinstated in service the learned single judge allowed his writ petition and his dismissal order was quashed and orders for his reinstatement were made with 50% back wages the state of rajasthan filed an appeal against this order before division bench of the high court which was dismissed the state is now before this court against the order of reinstatement passed by the rajasthan high court we must reiterate that the high court of rajasthan both in the writ petition and special appeal had allowed the case of respondent fool singh only on the ground that now since he has been acquitted by a criminal court on the same set of facts and charges on which he had faced a departmental proceeding the orders passed in departmental proceedings are liable to be quashed and he must be reinstated in service as we have already referred above none of the other arguments raised on behalf of the private respondent challenging procedural anomalies on the departmental proceedings violation of principles of natural justice and fair play or lack of jurisdiction of the authority had found favor with either the learned single judge or the division bench the case of the state who is the appellant before this court is that the respondent was a member of a discipline force there were extremely serious charges against the respondent in the departmental proceedings he was charged of threatening and extorting money from a member of public roaming in a public place under the influence of liquor and then using a fire alarm and causing injuries which were all very serious charges respondent was given full opportunity to defend his case in the departmental proceedings he was given the opportunity to cross examine the prosecution witnesses and in fact he also presented nine defense witnesses who were examined in the departmental proceedings the disciplinary authority concluded that the delinquent constable had committed an act of gross indiscipline and negligence as well as derelication of the duties and of misbehavior and misconduct and all this had blackened the image of rajasthan police in public under the circumstances the delinquent officer cannot be retained in police service and was thus dismissed from service with immediate effect the state would also argue that the acquittal by the criminal court is of no conscience consequence as far as departmental proceedings are concerned the question before this court is therefore only to see whether the respondent 
can be reinstated in service for the reason that now on the same set of charges he has been acquitted by a criminal court there should be no doubt in law on this subject departmental proceeding is different from a criminal proceeding the fundamental difference between the two is that whereas in a departmental proceeding a delinquent employee can be held guilty on the basis of preponderance of probabilities in a criminal court the prosecution has to prove its case beyond reasonable doubt in short the difference between the two proceedings would lie in the nature of evidence and the degree of its scrutiny the two forum therefore run at different levels for this reason this court has consistently held that merely because a person has been acquitted in a criminal trial he he cannot be ipso facto reinstated in service be that as it may a delinquent employee after his dismissal from service nevertheless seeks reinstatement when he is acquitted by a criminal court on the same set of charges and facts a very heavy reliance is then placed on a decision of this court given in captain m paul anthony versus bharat gold mines limited reliance was placed on this decision by the present respondent as well before the learned single judge as well as before the division bench of rajasthan high court both the courts have relied on this judgment while giving their decision in favor of the respondent in captain m paul anthony this court had indeed had that as the petitioner before them had been acquitted on the same set of charges by a criminal court he should be reinstated in service stop